Before we begin, let us open up with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we are thankful for what we have in Christ. We are thankful that Christ's blood stands between us, that our sins are forgiven not by the merits of our goodness, not by the merits of our works, not by the merit of our lives, but instead by what you have done. Lord, we are forgiven because Christ lived perfectly. We are forgiven because Christ was the perfect lamb, the perfect sacrifice, the perfect priest who offered a sacrifice once, and it covers everything. And for that, we say thank you. Lord, today we are mindful of those who are in the path of Hurricane Irma. We pray for those, especially our brothers and sisters in the Lord, Lord, who this morning, instead of meeting and fellowshipping, instead of hearing from your word, are, again, bunkered down, are, are trying to just ride out the storm. Be with them, encourage them. Lord, we pray that after this storm, their testimony of kindness, their testimony of fellowship, their testimony of love in their communities might bring great honor and great glory to your name. We also think of Pastor Tim and his family as they will be coming home from vacation. I pray that you would give them traveling mercies. I pray that you would bring him back refreshed. And we also think of Josh and Christine as they are beginning a new chapter in their life. Encourage them and provide a direction in their lives. Lord, be with us as we open up your word. I pray that it might challenge our hearts as it has challenged mine. I pray that you might use these words, not mine, not my words at all, Lord, but the words of your your scripture in our lives. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. There is a game that you can go out and buy, and it's called Would You Rather? And the way the game works is it has a bunch of different questions. Would you rather do this or do that? And you have to try to guess what the other person would rather do. So maybe we could, if we would play Would You Rather, we could come up with some of those. Maybe something simple like, would you rather spend your whole life saving for one vacation, a big, glorious vacation, or go on a teeny little one every year? What would you rather do? Would you rather go outside for a hike or have to stay inside? Would you rather see the great nature or would you rather be walking around a mall? Would you rather wear, here's a good one, would you rather wear wet socks for the rest of your life or only get to take a shower or a bath once a year? I don't know. I would rather do neither, right? <laughs> Those both sound pretty horrific, okay? Well, you can make this game. There's lots of really, really funny questions. There's things that sort of make you think. And... But in life, are we not faced with some of these questions, would you rather, that are a lot more serious? Maybe it's a course of medical treatment. There was a young man, I think he was nine years old at our last church, he wasn't feeling good, went to the emergency room, mom finally persuaded the doctors to do an MRI, and he had a brain tumor. And so there were a couple different courses of action, and the answer is, would you rather do this one or that one? Oh man, were the stakes not a lot higher? It's not as simple as wet socks or showers at that point. Maybe it's a question of a job. Do you move on? Do you stay put? Maybe it's a question of retirement. Do you retire now? Do you continue to work? All of these decisions, unlike the first round, have consequences, right? And they're a little more serious. They affect our life. Well, our text today sort of sets up this would-you-rather scenario. It sets up this back and forth, but unlike some of these other things we talked about, the consequences are even more severe. The consequences are eternal in nature. So the text today asks this question, would you rather drink from a dry cistern or drink from a fresh spring of water? Would you rather dry, drink from a dry cistern, that is a, a reservoir meant to collect water that has leaked out and there is nothing in there, or some fresh water? What would you like to drink from? Now the, the, the answer might seem obvious, but our text today makes it clear that this is an, this is an imagery, this is an analogy for something greater. And while you and I might say, well, no, no, duh, Pastor DeWalt, I'd rather drink fresh water than no water, the imagery in our text today paints the picture that normally we choose the first. We choose the first. So our text today is Jeremiah. Jeremiah in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. It is our text today for this morning. Let me read it, and then we will begin talking about it. 
the Lord spoke to me. He said, Go and declare in the hearing of the people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I have fond memories of you, how devoted you were to me in your early years. I remember how you loved me like a bride. You followed me through the wilderness, through a land that had never been planted. Israel was set apart to the Lord. They were like the first fruits of a harvest to him. All who tried to devour them were punished. Disaster came upon them, says the Lord. But then verse 4. Now listen to what the Lord has to say, you descendants of Jacob, all you family groups from the nation of Israel. This is what the Lord says. What fault could your ancestors have possibly found in me that they strayed so far? They paid allegiance to worthless idols and so became worthless to me. They did not ask, where is the Lord who delivered us out of Egypt, who brought us through the wilderness, through a land of desert sands and rift valleys, through a land of droughts and deep darkness, through a land in which no one travels and where no one lives? I brought you to a fertile land so you could enjoy its fruit and its rich bounty. But when you entered my land, you defiled it. You made the land I call my own loathsome to me. Your priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those responsible for teaching my law, they did not really know me. Your rulers rebelled against me. Your prophets prophesied in the name of the god Baal. They all worshipped idols that could not help them. So once more I will state my case against you, says the Lord. I will also state it against your children and your grandchildren. Go west across the sea to the coast of Cyprus and see Send someone to East, to Kedar, and have them look carefully, see if such a thing has ever happened. Has a nation ever changed its gods, even though they are not really gods at all? But my people have exchanged me, their glorious God, for a God that cannot help them at all. Be amazed at this, O heavens. Be shocked and utterly dumbfounded, says the Lord. Do so because my people have committed a double wrong. They have rejected me, the fountain of life-giving water and have dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns, but cannot even hold water. Our text today breaks down into sort of three sections. It's like a conversation God is having with the people of Israel. And as often happens in conversations, the conversation gets a little more focused, a little more focused, and that happens here in the text. He sort of starts off by reminiscing the good old days in the first couple of verses. Then he asks a very poignant question to them, trying to draw a truth out into their lives. And then finally he gets down to, as the expression goes, brass tacks, and he says, here is my charge and my accusation against you. So let us consider this text. Let's start. We're going to go back to chapter 2, verse 1. Let us see the good old days as God reminds them. The Lord spoke to me. He said, go declare this in the hearing of the people of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. I have fond memories of you. I remember a time when we were close. I remember a time you were devoted. The example here, like a bride who is devoted, a new bride. It's like that couple that just gets married and they come to church and they're holding hands as they're walking. They're sitting in the pew. They have their arms around each other. Every single moment, it's like, you weren't here for two minutes and I missed you. Where have you been? It's been so long. It's been a minute and a half, right? God says, Israel, you were like this devoted bride. We had this close, this wonderful relationship. Now, one of the questions I had when I read through this text, it says here in verse 3, I remember, excuse me, verse 2, I remember how you loved me like a new bride. You followed me through the wilderness. And it raised a question in my mind, wait a minute. When Israel was in the wilderness, they weren't always faithful. How can you say that Israel was faithful? And I think the answer is, it's like when we reminisce about an old time and we forget some of the negative things. It's not that they didn't occur, but it's just we're not the point of the story. We're trying to say a good story. We're trying to remember the good things. You know, we went camping and we had a great time. You forget the fact that you were bitten up by mosquitoes the whole night. You know, we went on this trip and it was amazing. And you forget the fact that you got to the hotel and they didn't have a room for you. You know, you, it's, not the, it's, it's not that it didn't occur, but just that your focus was on the good times. And there were times in Israel's history they were faithful. There were times as Israel walked through the wilderness, there were times, because this is written after, they're in the land as they've gone through, you know, the book of Joshua. How does the book of Joshua end? All during the life of the elders who outlived Joshua, Israel was faithful. 
And so there were times of faithfulness. And during that time, the end of verse 3 says, God, Israel was set apart to the Lord. They were a first fruits of the harvest. In this time, the first fruits was the first part of the offering, either a animal or grains or whatever it was, the first, the best part. And it was supposed to go to God. It was offered to him. And when it was taken to the temple, it was the priest's portion of things. It was not for the common man. And here he says, Israel was this first fruits. Israel was not for the common man. And he sort of launches off and he goes here, all who tried to devour them were punished. Every nation, every country who tried to go up against Israel was defeated. Just a couple of accounts we probably all remember. The Exodus account, right? <laughs> did Egypt, did Pharaoh stand a chance against God and his mighty plagues? And as they crossed the Red Sea, they did not stand a chance. God fiercely protected them. The story of Amalek. You guys remember this one? There, Israel is going through the land, and Amalek is one of these nations along the way, and they attack this is the story where Moses holds up his rod and Joshua and Caleb are on either side. They hold it up, and as long as the rod is up, they are defeating their enemies, and God gives them great victory. And then Balaam. Another account during the Exodus. Another account on their wanderings. The people of Israel are down. Balaam says, these people are attacking me. He's a king from a country. He, of course, hires Balak, the priest, and they're like, curse these people! Curse these people because they're going to overrun us! And God says to him, oh, no, you don't. <laughs> and so he out opens his mouth, and what does he do instead of cursing the people of Israel? He blesses the people of Israel. And Balaam's like, what are you doing? Balaam's like, well, I have to do what God told me to do. All of these accounts and many others where Israel was faithful, God is protecting them. This good old days. Israel was faithful. God is this fiercely protective sort of husband, this fiercely protective God over his people. No harm comes to them. But as already mentioned, that does not last forever. Israel is not an example of perfect faithfulness. I would say they're probably not even a great example of partial faithfulness because they wander away. So we get to the second part, this question. This question to the people of Israel. 2 verse 4. Listen to what the Lord has to say, you descendants of Jacob, all you family groups from the nation of Israel. This is a family meeting, okay? Have any of you had those before where there's a lot of people, a lot of family? We've got to talk about something. This is a family-style meeting. Okay, all you people, God says, I have a question for you. What did I do that scared you away? God says, what did I do that made you become unfaithful? What did I do wrong? Did I miss something? You know, on the contract, did I not cross my T's and dot my I's that you became unfaithful? Did I not protect you? Did I not provide manna in the wilderness? Did I not give you food to eat and water to drink? Did I not protect you from your enemies? What did I do wrong that you strayed from me? And obviously we know the answer is God did nothing wrong. The people strayed by themselves. The end of verse 5 says, they paid allegiance to worthless idols and so became worthless to me. It's not that God did not love the people of Israel, because he does. You can't miss as you read through Isaiah, Jeremiah, these prophets which prophesied destruction, 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 but hope, right? Hope, a new covenant, I will bring you back to the land. God still loves them. And so when I was thinking about the idea of worthless, the um, example that came to my mind was some of the stuff we got rid of when we moved. When you move, you realize how much stuff you have accumulated, right? How many of you think there's too much stuff in your house as it is, huh? Some of you, yep. Don't we accumulate stuff? And we had lived in our house, what, five years? And it's like, how did we get all this stuff? Let's take this. Well, have we used it in the last five years? No. Will we think we used it again? Yeah, we have something nicer or well, we don't really like it anymore. Let's keep it, right? No. <laughs> it's a good chance to purge some of that stuff. I know um, slowly, slowly, I have been getting rid of some of my old computer stuff. I used to collect stuff like that. And so as we were packing stuff up, I sat down and I looked at it and I went, this is sort of cool and I think it's sort of cool, but it's really old and even if I were to put like a computer together with some of this stuff, it'd be so old it'd be worthless. So I threw it away. 
it wasn't that I wasn't thinking it was fun or wasn't thinking that it was nice, but it had no value, it had no importance, I couldn't do anything. Even if I put a computer together with all these leftover pieces that I had lying around, it'd be so slow and so old, it'd be like, you might as well just throw it away. It was worthless. Israel became worthless. It's not that God didn't love them, but he's like, there's, there's nothing going on here between you and me. You have forsaken me. You have followed worthless idols, and so now there's just no intimacy here between the two of us. 2 6, God says, They did not ask when the Lord delivered them out of Egypt, but he's telling a story. He says, The people never remembered all I did. He goes to the Exodus accounts in brief, and he says, They never stopped to remember. They never stopped to remember all that I had done. Now, I find it very interesting. Did God warn the people of Israel ahead of time that this would occur? Yeah. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, 10 through 12. When the Lord your God brings you to the land, he promised your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give you a land with a large, fine cities you did not build, houses filled with choice things you did not accumulate, hewn out cisterns you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. And you eat your fill, be careful not to forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, that place of slavery. So before they're even in the promised land, God says, be careful you don't forget. And in Jeremiah, he says, you forgot. You forgot. You stopped asking yourselves, isn't this the great God? You stopped reminding yourselves of all that I had done for you. When I read verse 7, it's almost like there's a sense of grief in God's heart. I brought you into a fertile land so you could enjoy its fruits and its rich bounty, but when you entered my land, you defiled it. You made the land I call my own loathsome to me. What did you do? Why did you do that? I prepared you. I I got you out of Egypt. I kept you safe. I provided for you. I brought you to a land. I got you into the land. And then you sought out worthless idols. And then he, in verse 8, he's going to tell us how bad it is. This morning when I got up, one of the things we after I got the girls fed, um, because our in-laws have cable TV, I went down and I turned on the weather channel. Will there be any pictures of what things are like? Have, did anybody else you do that this morning? Or some other channel? Okay. What does it look like? How bad was it? This text, this next verse says, let me tell you how bad Israel is. Let me tell you how far this nation has slipped. Let me tell you how undevoted they have become. 2 verse 8. Your priests did not ask, where is the Lord? Those responsible for teaching the law, they didn't know me. Your rulers rebelled against me. And to top it all off, your prophets prophesied in the name of the god Baal. They all worshipped idols that could not help them. Those responsible for the spiritual purity, the spiritual health of the people of Israel, the priests, the teachers, the prophets, the rulers, every single one of them, God says they have all worshipped false gods. They have all forsaken me. What did I do? What did I do that, that you people who are supposed to be my priests don't teach my law? What did I do that you teachers of the law, you, you teach it, but there's no heart, you actually don't know me? Can you imagine that? It's like a pastor preaching the gospel message who has never been converted. <laughs> he says, you teachers, you don't know me. The rulers, instead of following my instructions, rebelled, and the prophets, all oh, the prophets, Jeremiah probably is especially touched here because he's a prophet of God. He's prophesying in the name of God. And he's like, all you, my fellow prophets, you're prophesying in the name of Baal. We were supposed to destroy the people of Baal. We were supposed to wipe out their prophets. And here you are adopting them and prophesying for Baal. How far the nation has fallen. So finally, God lays out his judgment. 
finally God says, okay, I'm going to make my case. The, the wording here, the beginning of 2 verse 9, I will state my case against you. This is like God is setting up a court setting. In um, verse 12, he talks about the heavens. This is a typical thing used by the prophets. Isaiah and several of the minor prophets use the heavens. They're like witnesses. He's like, let me gather up these witnesses, and we're going to put on a case. This is going to be God is the judge and the prosecutor, and we are going to weigh you. There is a judgment case against you. So once more, I will state my case against you, says the Lord. I will state it against your children and grandchildren. So this is against everyone. And he tells a story. He starts out with a story. Go west, across the sea to the coast of Cyprus, and see. Send someone east to Kedar and have them look carefully. So these are east and west locations. So like, send someone all the way out to California, send someone to the tip of Maine. East and west, okay? As far as you can go both directions. Look carefully. See if such a thing has ever happened. So he says, go look among all these pagan people. See if you have ever seen this. Has a nation ever changed its gods, even though they are not really gods at all? Has a nation ever changed their gods? In this society, if country A would con attack and con conquer country B, so A defeats B, the assumption was that the gods of country A were more powerful than the gods of country B. Obviously, we won. Our God is better than your God. And so for country A to go into there, attack, destroy, take them over, and then go, let's get rid of our gods and adopt your gods, would be preposterous. <laughs> we just defeated your gods. Our God's greater than your God. They would never change them. But Israel has. Remind, remember with me Elijah at Mount Carmel, Right? One of the amazing scenes where we see God versus Baal. God versus God. Big G versus little g. Elijah says, you can go first, you prophets of Baal. They set up their altar. They're dancing. They're screaming. And Elijah's like, um, maybe Baal's asleep. Maybe he's on a trip. Be louder. And so they're cutting themselves, and they're wailing, and they're going on and on and on and on. And does Baal answer on the mountain? Does Baal send fire from heaven? Elijah's turn. Pour some water on there. Ah, some more. Keep going, keep going, keep going. There's so much water, they, they built a trough around it, it's full of water. And Elijah prays a simple prayer, God, show them that you are the only true God. Boom! Fire from heaven consumes rocks, <laughs> consumes everything. Have you ever, guys ever seen a fire so hot it can consume a rock? God's holy fire coming down from heaven consumes everything. And the people say, whoa, the God, he is God. Baal is not God. And they go and they kill all the prophets of Baal. And you're like, yes, Baal is defeated. They'll never, ever, 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 ever worship Baal again because Baal is obviously worthless. And what did the people of Israel do? <laughs> they worship Baal again. He says, they've exchanged the true God, the God who could send fire from heaven for the worthless God who couldn't do anything and my people have exchanged them. Verse 12, be amazed at this. Be shocked, utterly dumbfounded, says the Lord. Wow. Wow. How crazy are you? Imagine with me, we're, we're in the home buying process right now, trying to get through all the hoops and stuff. Imagine with me if you were to go out today and you were to able, and you went out and you purchased the house, and it had everything you ever wanted. Okay? So, gentlemen, if you wanted a workshop, it had the workshop with all the best tools. Ladies, you wanted a sewing room, it had a sewing room with all the cool stuff. You wanted a piano room, it had a beautiful Steinway Grand Concert piano in there, and no one to sleep in the bedroom. It was all yours. <laughs> everything you could possibly want. You know you, you like to find oak. Well, everything is hand-carved oak furniture. It's all included beautiful bathroom vanities, beautiful kitchen, everything you could possibly want. And you buy the house, it's a perfect price, you're like, it's yours for free. Hey, I'll take it, right? And you walk in the door, and you and your husband go, this is perfect. I like that. Oh, I like that. I like this. Oh, this is exactly how I want it. And you go, perfect. Let's rip it all up and get rid of it. 
And so you take those beautifully hand-carved oak furnitures and you go outside and you burn them. And then you go to the dollar store and you get some plastic stuff. Okay? You take that beautiful grand piano and you say, kids, you want to jump on top of it? You want to take some wire cutters and cut out some of those strings? Let's do it! Take that sewing room and you say, oh, let me get all the cats from the animal shelter and let them play in there. Take all my yarn and just go for it, you know? Uh, man, that perfect tool room. Yay, neighbors, you want to come borrow it? You don't have to take it back. You don't have to bring it back. You can take it all, right? The tools sort of wander away. It would be insane, right? How many of you would do that? <laughs> I wouldn't do it. It's preposterous. It's insanity. And God says, Israel, you are insane. You, what you're doing is insanity. What you're doing is preposterous. You have God, and you chose Baal. You had God, and you chose Baal. Verse 13. So he says, My people have committed a double wrong. They have rejected me, the fountains of life giving water. They have dug cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns which cannot even hold water. A cistern was a way of collecting rainwater. In ancient Israel, there's not a lot of it. Um, the island I grew up on, there was not a lot of rain. Some of the houses had cisterns. They would collect all the, you know, here you take your house, the water, and it goes and you drain it, and it just goes out into the grass, right? There you collect it, because there's not a lot of water. You make the cistern. My understanding is that there's a lot of limestone in Israel and Palestine. And limestone doesn't hold water really well. <laughs> so they would put plaster and stuff to try to seal it, but eventually it would crack and the water would all be gone. He says here, I am this life-giving water. But the people chose to build their own cisterns and they're leaky. There's nothing left except for some dry dirt and some mud. How many of you kids used to play, as kids used to play with mud, right? It's a part of growing up. There's not even wet mud. <laughs> it's completely dry. My people have rejected me. It reminds me of John 4, 13 through 14. Jesus said, Everyone who drinks some of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks some of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. The water I give will become in him a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. Jesus, the living water. God says, I am like a fresh brook. I gave them everything they needed for life. And they said, eh, we'll do without you. We'll build our own. We can do this by ourselves. Off we go, and of course it fails. And God says, I have something against you. Now, it is easy to stand and mock the people of Israel. <laughs> You saw God separate the Red Sea. You saw fresh manna every morning. You saw God separate the Jordan. You saw God make the walls of Jericho fall down. You saw the prophets. You saw Elijah reigning at God, sending fire from heaven. You saw the judges. You saw Samson. You saw all these things. And you, and Israel, you, you poor so God, you're crazy. But can we not be just like the people of Israel? And that the answer is yes. As I think through this text, I think it's very easy, actually, super easy, too easy, painfully easy to draw parallels between them and us. Israel had moments of devotion. Israel had these times where they were close to God. Do we not have those times in our lives, too? Do we not have times where we are intimately close to God. We are reading his word. We are delving into everything. Do we not have those moments? There are times we can forget all that God has done. Israel did. They did not ask, where is the God who brought us out of the promised land? Can we not forget the God who saved us? Can we not forget the God who has given us great blessings in Jesus Christ? Let me read for you 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. It says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he gave us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That is, to an inheritance imperishable, undefiled, unfading. It is reserved in heaven for you, who by God's power are protected through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. We have all these blessings through Jesus Christ. 
the blessings of the gospel. That we who were enemies of God are now his beloved children. Behold, a manner of love the Father has given to us, given to us that we should be called what? Children of God, right? God loves us so much we're his children. He has adopted us, legal terms. He has made us heirs. He has provided heaven for us. He says, I will go to prepare a place for you. And the best part is not that you're going to have this amazing place, but rather that where I am, you will be. Sometimes I think we overemphasize the fact that there will be a place for us. When in reality, the focus is not that. It's actually being with Jesus. But can we not forget it? Can we not live our lives as I used to challenge some teenagers? Can we not live like Christian atheists? Christian atheists. That is a Christian who says they believe God's word. They do believe it, but they don't live like it. (laughs) We can do that. Israel exchanged the true God for worthless gods. Can we not do that as well? We have in the New Testament the example of Demas. 2 Timothy 4.10 says, Demas deserted me since he loved the present age. We have this example of this man who was on fire for God who later said, eh, I love something else better. Can we not love other gods more than our God? Maybe that God, and I think there's, there's a lot, a couple things here on my list. I have five things on my list, but I think they all come from one, one giant God that we can set up. And I think in our lives, the biggest God that all of us can have, and we can trace all of our little gods to this one big God, little G God in our lives. And that big false God in our lives is us. It is us. We exalt ourselves. I want this. I like that. I want success. I want a family. I want happiness. I want the job to go well, this, that, this, and always they come back to one thing. They all have one thing in common, me. Is it not very easy for us to make ourselves like a God and say, oh, God of the heavens, God who could send fire from heaven, God who could send Jesus Christ, God who raised Jesus from the dead, move on over, here I come. I'm going to do what I want. And we would all look at that and go, no. I can't do that, right? But in reality, we do. We do that. We are good forgetters, just like the people of Israel. Now, there is a warning. Israel was forgot God. We can forget God. But there is a warning for us, and that is, just as God did not let Israel get away with our sin, will God let us get away with our sins? I want to briefly look over and just compare two, two passages with you. First, Jer- starting Jeremiah 18, verse 14. If you continue through the book of Jeremiah, there's lots of prophecies of destruction, but we're going to just sort of sit here for a little bit. We're going to read this one. We're going to compare then to a New Testament text. Jeremiah 18, 14 says this. Does the snow ever completely vanish from the rocky slopes of Lebanon? Do the cool waters from those distant mountains ever cease to flow? The answer is no. Yet my people have forgotten me and offered sacrifices to worthless idols. This makes them stumble along the way they live and leave their old reliable paths of their fathers. They have left them to walk and by paths and roads that are not smooth and level, so their land will become an object of horror. People will forever hiss out to their scorn over it. All who pass that way will be filled with horror, and I will shake their heads in derision. I, this is God speaking, I will scatter them before their enemies. Like dust blowing in front of a burning east end, I will turn my back on them and not look favorably on them when disaster strikes them. God had warned people of Israel way back in the Pentateuch, back with Moses, if you forsake me, there are consequences. Israel had this covenant with God. If you are faithful with me, I will bless you. If you are not faithful, I will discipline you. And you see this pattern over and over and over again, and God finally says, enough is enough. It is time. And so the nation of Israel in the north, and then later the nation of Judah in the south, are captured. 
Assyria takes the north, Babylon takes the south. They are led into captivity. God says, you have forsaken me long enough. I'm not going to let you do this anymore. I love you too much. The book of Hebrews says the same thing to us. Pastor Tim's going to get there in a little bit. Hebrews 12, verse 5 says this. Have you forgotten the exhortations addressed to you as sons? My son, do not scorn the Lord's discipline or give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son he accepts. Endure your suffering as, dis- endure your suffering as discipline. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are not experiencing discipline, something all sons have shared in, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Imagine with me, you have a child, and you're out somewhere, and your child is acting up. That never happens, right? Okay. That never, those of you who have grandchildren, that never happens with your grandchildren, right? Imagine it could be you and your grandchildren, they're acting up, they would never do that. But imagine they were and you're trying to get them to stop, and then someone just randomly, maybe you're at Walmart, and a Walmart employee walks up, picks up your child, and whacks them on their behind, and says, you obey, and then walks away. How happy would you be with that employee? (laughs) Don't you dare touch my child. Don't you dare touch my grandchild. They are not yours. I'll deal with this, right? You probably would call the manager. It would be quite a fiasco, right? God says here, the children I love, because I love them, I discipline them. And he's talking here to Christians. He says, I love my children so much, I will not allow them to continue in their sin. I will bring discipline. He uses the analogy of our our earthly fathers. How many of us as children liked it when we were disciplined? I hated it. But I came to that wise old age, I think I was at college sometime, where it finally hit me. When I looked out at some of my college peers, and you could tell whose fathers and mothers had disciplined them, and whose fathers and mothers had not. You could tell that. And there was that age in my life where I went, oh, thank you, mom and dad. (laughs) I sure hated you then, but thank you now. I see how beneficial that was in my life. God says, if we see that in our lives from our earthly parents, should we not respond the same way with our heavenly parents? That discipline, it should not be something where it's like, oh. But instead, it's a sign of God's love. It's a sign that we are his children. And so the Old Testament with Jeremiah, God said, enough with you, you people of Israel. You have wandered too far away from me. All your spiritual leaders, they are just going the wrong way. I tried to get rid of Baal, and you just kept chasing him, and you have exchanged me, the glorious God, for a false God. And the time of reckoning has come. I am bringing discipline into your life. Now, Israel, this is sort of an interesting thing. When Israel came back from exile, they weren't perfect. But did they ever worship false gods again? (laughs) No. In fact, one of their problems was when God, Jesus came along, they're like, you're not God, we can't worship you! They completely missed that Jesus was God, and that was one of the reasons they were so hostile against him. But they never worshipped the Baal again. They were never tempted by the Astroth poles and by the gods of the foreign countries, because they had learned their lesson. God means business. The same way for us as children, God's heavenly children, he loves us so much, but it's easy to forget. It is easy to forget And the book of Hebrews says, I'm your heavenly father. I love you. I don't forget. If I need to, I will bring discipline in your life to correct you, to bring you back on that narrow path. But here's the good news. Here's some encouragement. Psalm 1611 says this, You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. In your right hand are eternal pleasures. That cistern that we hew out for ourselves, that false god of I, we think when we dig it out, we think when we create it, that we will find joy, that we will find satisfaction, that we will find that itch for happiness is met, and I no longer feel that anymore. But when we make ourselves God, 
do we ever find satisfaction? No. There's a reason the world has to keep chasing things. The reason the world has become more and more depraved. It's because as they say, this will make me happy, they realize it does not. And so now this will make me happy. No, it does not. Psalm says you want to find real pleasure, real joy, it is found in intimacy with God. So, here's the question for us. Would we rather drink from a dry cistern, the God of I, the God that promises great things but can't deliver, or from the fresh spring of water, the living water of Jesus Christ? One will bring us pain, hardship, false promises. The other brings us pleasure, joy. As we looked at Wednesday night in 2 Corinthians 5, we will stand before Christ, he will examine our lives, and Paul says, my ambition is when I stand before him that my life pleases him. Paul says, I know that eternal things, those are the things that count, so I will live my life for God. Paul says, I'm not drinking out of a cistern. I'm not making a hole and trying to fill it with myself or with other things. I'm not trying to satisfy myself and try to work for myself. Everything I do is for Christ. Everything I do is for God because I know that is the living water. That is the true water. That is the water that satisfies. And so the question for us is, what do we drink from? Now we probably all say, I would never do that, or I don't want to drink from myself. I don't want to drink from this dry cistern. I don't want to serve false gods. But is that not something we do? You know, there are areas in my life that I had to stop and go, wait a minute, this is like a false cistern that I have created. <laughs> this is a place in my life where it's like, oh, this will be good for you. In reality, it's destructive. It's just feeding myself. The only source of satisfaction, of joy, of pleasures forevermore are with faithfulness with Jesus Christ. So, would you rather, would you rather drink from a cistern or drink from a spring? I hope today that you would rather drink from the life-giving water of Jesus Christ. If you're here today and you do not know what that means, you do not know we've talked about some of these imagery, the gospel, you're like, I'm not quite sure on that. Or maybe I'm a little fuzzy on those things please come talk to me. Because what we've been talking about today is for Christians. If you are saved here today, we will see Christ. Whether we're living for ourselves or living for God, our eternity is settled. Amen? Isn't that a wonderful thing? But if you don't know Christ, it's not a question of will you be rewarded by Christ or not. It's a matter of your eternal destiny. If you're not sure, come talk to me. Come talk to one of the deacons. Get it settled. There is nothing more joyful than knowing that your eternal destiny is settled because of Jesus Christ dying and resurrecting for you. And those of us here who know Christ, those of us here who say, yes, I am a son or a daughter of the living God, the question is, who do we serve? Where do we drink from? Where do we try to find our satisfaction? Do we do it in ourselves, or do we do it in God? In a minute, I'm going to pray. And then we're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And if there's something in your life and you're like, oh, man, I know there is this area and it is a false God that I have been creating and I have been looking for all the answers there and they're not there. If you'd like to come up and have some of the deacons come up but we need to to meet you, to talk to, to challenge you, to be able to share Christ's word and to pray with you. Because again, Christians, brothers and sisters in the Lord, God says, I'm going to look at your life one day. You can't expect to live your life completely for yourself, then meet Jesus Christ and get that thumbs up. It doesn't work. In fact, Hebrews warns us, that text we read, you think you're okay? You think you can hide it under the rug? You know, like a child who tries to hide that they didn't clean up their bedroom? In the reality, they just shoved it under the bed or in the closet, Right? You can't see it, so it's not there. God can see your heart. He knows if you're here this morning, and your heart 
is at home with the football game this afternoon, or your heart is in another place. He knows that. He knows your ambitions, your desires. He knows what's first. We can put on a good show. We can come to church. We can do the right thing. But God knows. God knows if we are drinking from his living water, if that is our satisfaction, that intimate relationship with God through Christ, or if instead we are serving ourselves. So who do you serve?